Okay, we're recording. I don't know. Uh, usually we're waiting for Jess, but maybe she was running late. Anyway, um, hi, Mari. How are you? You're in Pretty LA, good. LA or something. Uh, I moved back to the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, oh my God. So I, think, I think you told me that with your dogs and cats. It, with all the dogs are here. Um, they're all on the ground and you might see them occasionally pop into my lap. That's always, that's always fine. Um, so let's see, I'm going to put, at least for myself, I'm going to put some, me on speaker view. There we go. Um, actually, what I'm going to do, I can spotlight you for everybody, but then, so this is going to be pretty informal. What I wanted to do, I, you know, I was looking at your website today and I just realized like how much you've published. Holy cow. Like, I thought it was like, you know, that much, maybe that much, which is a chunk, but there was like, it was just like, so much <laughs> and and I was like let's just let's just keep this informal and ask Mari about everything she's published in order um but, but um I mean I almost think I, I think that'll work actually so if you don't mind I think that's how we'll do it and um I've got a um Bruce are you getting some ideas about a oh oh just so you know I see little chat things go up um I can't read chat um that's fine We'll keep, but, we'll keep tabs of it on it. Yeah, yeah. If anyone has any questions for me, like feel free to DM me or whatever on Twitter or Instagram. Um, yeah, because I'm on an iPad and I just, um, I, it doesn't let me look at chat and also talk at the same time or something. Mm -hmm. Like I, maybe I'm just too ancient to figure it out. <laughs> um, um, I see that Jess is here too. So I'm going to get, her to raise her hand too so that I, I can um at least at least uh go back and forth I with think her. I'm clapping <laughs> oh you are yeah just stop clapping and raise that your work? hand uh -oh. uh, raise hand did that work there we go yep clapping and raise hand oh good um, I, I, it's a grid so I'm not just staring at my face <laughs> no. yeah sorry because I spotlighted you um so um oh boy so anyway so Sorry, I got sidetracked by the. Now she lowered her hand. I got. <laughs> oh, am I supposed to keep, keep it up? I'm up, sorry, yeah. Tom. No, okay. no, no, keep it up. So we can, all right. Where I can see like them. People here, and it's just like lose you, and I, I want to get be able it. To, That's to, like advanced zooming, Tom. I know, okay. I know. All right, we're, I we're get gonna it. We get to the end because I've been asking everybody to do chromatic <laughs> selfies lately. <gasps> oh, I can't wait. All right, we'll do that later. So anyway, I, I did want to tell everybody. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is, is walk through a bunch of a bunch of Mari's work and starting from the early stuff and then um, up to the book that's coming out through through uh, Field Mouse, I think. No, no, no. Um, oh, it is Field Mouse. Mm -hmm. um, and you've published in so many places. You've published at like large scale publishers. You've self-published. You've gone with little publishers. You've painted on walls. You've done things on in mini comics. You've started these databases, all these amazing things. So I'm hoping that we can sort of hit upon that, but not in a... Um, what mostly we're we're interested in here is like is like um, when you know how did you make these decisions? What made you want to do this? What made you go that direction? What what made you um, think it was time to use a brush pen? I saw that on your Patreon recently. Like oh, I did this in '98 with a brush pen after a mic, you know, stuff like that. So sometimes it's about the brush pen. Sometimes it's like I want to do auto bio. Sometimes it's like I want to try YA. So anyway, so that's how we'll spin it if that's okay. And, yeah. Um, I mean, just, just, I know, so y'all are students, right? Is right. That, so I, you know, just want to preface this with everyone's journey is different and, um, and the, and just the context of what was happening in the world and comics was so completely different than what the environment is now that there's no way you're, you would even want to follow in my footsteps. No. <laughs> Um, so yeah, everything that I did is completely um, moot now. I think as far as like wanting, when people say, "Well, how how do I get to where you are?" I'm like, I don't know. Like I I followed like I just kind of zigzag there, but like it's a completely different way to go there now. And I have some idea of how you know to get an agent, like in in ways that I didn't do it. Um, like I know how the the system generally works right now, so. So just take my anecdotes for what they are, um, but don't, you know, don't necessarily try to learn from them 
you know, or, or apply them to yourself um, because there's other ways to do it that are much easier than the way I did it. <laughs> Well, I, I think that's a real lesson that we we actually do try and, and instill here is that like is like once you're really dedicated to to the art and you get some skills, you're really um, your path is your own, and it's and it's a real joy to figure figure it out and to and to follow your instincts or follow whatever connections come or to to follow um, you know follow what makes you happy or whatever aggravates you or just whatever whatever things you want to have ha you want to make happen, and that there aren't yeah, you're right. Those, you know, the, there's no simple strategy anymore, and everything's and, I, and yeah, learn to zigzag. So we'll start there and, and maybe end there as well. Learn to. It's zigzag. all a hustle. It's all a hustle, and oh. I love your all Tom. Like that is. Oh serious. yeah, yeah. Th thanks. I'm not trying to upstage you or anything. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm writing, like so. <laughs> writing hustle and zigzag there. So I'm going to share my screen if that's okay, and so that'll probably oh. visually. Um, um, minimize you on everyone else's screen but but we can still hear you and um i'm actually going to lower my hand and see if that does anything and so i but um and so i'm going to walk through um some of what's on your website and some of i've got like a million tabs open for some various publications of yours and stuff like that um before i start i want to say um if you've got a question while we're speaking, put it in the chat. But if you got a question at the end, we'll, um, we're happy to open it up to um, to turning your mics on and asking Mari questions. I think she'd be okay with that. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Um, I was also gonna say if yeah. if um if it's helpful, I can copy paste all the questions into like a local Word doc and and You're kind so of good. Uh, you know, there's also a, there's isn't there a question? No, I guess not. I used to think there was a question. There's sure. different. Yeah, there in other iterations of Zoom, that is a thing, but. I don't know how to do it. No. <laughs> okay. All right. Jess, you're but I'll on. try to collect, I'll gather the collection into a nice bouquet and, free, and try to ask them. And feel free to um, uh, find decent points to, to bring them on to the questions. I mean, okay, here we go. Sharing screen. So I'm at the bottom of Mari's website. Um, and even just looking at the self-published stuff, which is all the way at the bottom, because there's the entire, oh my God, it's amazing. Print by <laughs> bibliography, like just goes on and on and on. And, um, and it's amazing. And I have like, I had no idea you were in Henry and Glenn forever only because I've only seen one of them, for instance. And um, I, I didn't realize, I, I'm not going to get too, too nerdish about all this, but I didn't know you were in like Sarah Dyer's anthology and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, you can see that uh, Mari is self-publishing even as recently as 2020, in addition to all these other places that- Oh, uh, that's not everything. I've actually not updated that for a while. I did yeah. something more recent than that during the pandemic, um, but yeah. yeah. I, actually, you actually bought a bunch of them too. There were the writers. Oh wait, no, I did put it down there. I writers. love the writers. Oh yeah, it's down here on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah, that's great. I have somewhere around here, but um, yeah, I think that's really terrific. It's really, it's just, it's snarky and funny and at hundred percent accurate. <laughs> it's really funny that I was doing that the same time that Adrian Tomine was doing his thing, which is pretty much basically the same book. <laughs> uh, you know, I haven't read Adrian's book. So, so um, Adrian wrote a book about being a cartoonist that has some sour grapes in it. I, I, I guess that's an appropriate way to say it, but Mari has like a little funny zine that also has some sour grapes in it, but it's really funny. It's like, it's like, um, I sort of can't remember. It's like, um, you'll submit something to a publisher and then you'll be annoyed when you see cartoonists uh, getting ahead of you and stuff like that anyway. <laughs> anyway. But I didn't, I haven't read Adrian's book. So if you did the same thing, then. No. Okay. <laughs> well, my, mine's in the zine and his is like fancy looking. Right, right. Um, so really quickly, you were, you were um, born in Texas, but raised in, in San Francisco. Okay. Uh, Bay Area. I, I didn't move into the into San Francisco until I was an adult, but yeah, I was I was on the outskirts. Okay, and so we're looking at some zines dating back to 1998. So tell us about what made you um, want to make zines at in that time period. Um, it was after I read. Uh, well, so I think it was like 95. I started dating this guy who was really into indie comics. And I kind of discovered a couple on my own um, before dating this guy. Um, so we kind of connected on this and um, on this fact. And then 
he introduced me to uh, Twisted Sisters, mm. the anthology by Diane Newman, who recently sadly passed away. Uh, and there was, I mean, the, the anthology was basically a bunch of punk rock women telling personal stories and I was just riveted. I'm like, oh, we get to do this. This is exciting. And, um, and really like I'd always wanted to be a writer um, up to then, like I wanted to be a novelist and it hadn't really occurred to me to tell my own stories because people didn't really do that back then. Like memoir was reserved for celebrity mm. and not everyday people. So when I was reading this, these like punk rock women telling their just awesome little stories, um, I was like, damn, I, I can draw and I have, sto I have some stories. Uh, and so I just, decided to do it um at right before that time i'd gotten a little disillusioned a lot disillusioned with um not just novel writing but specifically the publishing industry when i tried to start um when i tried to publish my novels that i'd written at the ages of 18 and 21 and i'm really glad that they didn't get published but i you know i got a peek into the industry and how competitive and brutal it was and i realized what i wanted to do my whole life wasn't actually what I wanted to do anymore. I'm like, this is horrible. I don't, this isn't what I want to do. I want to write. I don't want to, you know, be part of that scene. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I kind of gave up my idea, my dreams of writing novels. And at the time I had just started working as a video game, well, producer, but like as a writer, I wanted to write for video games. And so I'm like, well, I'll, you know, I'll do this instead. And I don't know, the, the comics thing just kind of scratch the creative itch for me I guess because I I wasn't completely cognizant that I'd switched from novel writing to zine making but that's exactly what I did and um and when, once I started I, I it's like I was a monster like that's <laughs> all I think about was just making comics like I just I, that's all I wanted to do and I was just yeah I was ravenous to make comics and I mean I still am so <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I did it. I, I just, I just really wanted to make them. That's awesome. I wasn't cognizant. I switched from novel writing to zine making, you said. So it sort of happened as you were working and you just were suddenly, wow, I'm making comics. I'm making zines. I'm not a novelist anymore. Well, it wasn't. Yeah, I was like, I, I, I don't want to be a writer anymore. Like, I, I'm not going to follow that dream. And then, yeah, that's when I got obsessed with zines. And like, it, it didn't you know, it took me probably a decade before I realized, oh, that happened at the same time. What a coincidence. Like I had another outlet, but like at the time I'm just mm -hmm. like, oh, my dreams are lost. Forget them, forget them. I'm going this other direction. And, um, but then, you know, honestly, when I dreamed about novel writing, I was, you know, dreaming about Angela Lansbury's role in Murder, She Wrote. She died today. Rest in peace, Angela. Wow. I but I was like, oh, you know, I wanted to be, you know, a feminist novelist, you know, or, you know, Romancing the Stone or, you know, all those fun flicks where, um, where people got to make books and be rich and, and do things. And, and that was kind of my dream when I started making zines or comics, like that was not my dream. I had zero aspirations for anything other than to make my like friends laugh. So it was a much smaller, like, oh, I'll make up like a dozen of these and maybe sell them at a, at a zine fest or, or we, there weren't zine fest, but like at ape or, you know, get them into anthologies. But like, I was just doing it for the fun of it. And that was the case for a very, very long time. Like I didn't have any higher aspirations at all. Like I, you know, I was, as far as a career at that point, I was focused on video games. Awesome. So the takeaway there is that like the 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 reason was different. Like you you didn't want riches and fame. You wanted to make your friends laugh. I love that. Excuse me. Yeah, I just I wanted to make art. And I just it just, just felt art. really tell stories. Like it was just fun. Cool. So I'm just scrolling up on the website. So if there are are dis, um, discrepancies in the timeline, let me know. But would so is it safe to say that somewhere after there you moved into and did this self-published self um, riff on on um, this feminist story here? Well, so it was, yeah, 2000, 2001, I read Inga Lucio's novel, Kant, A Declaration of Independence, which was probably the first feminist writing I'd ever written. 
And I was completely blown away. You know, it was the first one. And just like, I loved her voice and I loved the things she was saying. And I, um, I wanted to connect and tell her how much I loved it. And, um, and so I think I wrote to her and asked if it was okay if I excerpted part of it and just illustrated it, which, so that's what that was. The Estra's comics lasted from 1998 to 2009 or 10. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was just like in the middle of it all. And I just, I just wanted to connect with her and um, draw her book, like parts of her book. So that's how that came about. And so that worked. So you, you managed to connect with her. Oh yeah, she loved it. Yeah. That's awesome. And that's, you know, that's some, you know, I think you're, you're, um, you're so fearless sometimes, you know, and you, you do things like that really, it's, it's really inspiring, you know, that if a lot of times you don't realize like, oh, if I really, I'd like to adapt this, can I, can I write this person? Can I ask them? And sometimes you can, and sometimes they'll say yes. And maybe even more often than not. Oh, I'm just, I have no shame. No, I, I just, <laughs> yesterday I was in the airport coming back from CXC and I saw, I spotted my favorite person on TikTok, this, this woman who does, um, she, she forages and I, like, I heard her voice. I'm like, oh my God. And I just ran over to her and took a selfie <laughs> oh. to her. Completely shameless. I did that with Salman Rushdie too. I'm horrible. <laughs> Um, I, I'm pretty sure we have a lot of foragers on this call. So you, you foragers, keep keep the questions till at the end, and then we can talk mushrooms. It was Alexis Nicole. She's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, this is an interesting one. Um, there's not a date on it, at least not here on the website. Um, but this link is dead. It says, look inside. But I know you also produced a new book called Dirty Produce. So tell us what this is, if you don't mind. <laughs> Again, this was all for fun. Um, by the time this came around, comics was already kind of my career. Um, but, you know, I still like doing things that are not helpful to my career. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was um, it was probably after I moved to Los Angeles in 2013 or 14, oh. and I got invited to do the giant robot post-it note art show. And I made like a, just like five or six little post-its that are just silly of um, fruits and vegetables being kind of sexy with each other. And I was like, oh, this would make a cute little zine. And so I just made it into a little zine. Um, I think that's like one page or two pages just folded together and stapled. And and many, many years later, basically, I think it's 2001 or, or 2021 um, was when Dirty Produce, the book came out. But um, yeah, there's, there's just a long time <laughs> between making the zine and that, but like people really dug the zine. It's, it's funny. It's, um, yeah, it's just very goofy. And uh, yeah, the, the, the New York, when I was in the New Yorker, was it New Yorker Shouts and Murmurs? That's, they published a piece of some of my illustrations of Dirty Produce. Um, so, so my agent really liked it and he encouraged me to create a pitch. And so we, he was pitching it forever and uh, people were like, oh, this is funny, but we don't like the art or this is too dirty or this isn't dirty mm-hmm. enough. It wasn't right for anybody. Um, and then the New Yorker reached out to me and asked if I would like to submit something to them. And I'm like, sure. And I submitted a bunch of things and they really liked the dirty produce. And I'm like, okay, but it is you know, I can't go with your normal contract because they would own it mm. and try to sell it as a book. So I'm like, can we, and, and so it was actually a whole year that my agent was ne- renegotiating contact, the contract with the New Yorker so that it was, you know, so we could sell the book still. And at, so finally it comes out and um, they pay very little <laughs> and their contract is, is pretty intense. Um, But after it came out, like pretty instantly, we got the book deal with Workman Publishing, who he had actually sent Workman Publishing the pitch um, previously, like a year previously, but the person he sent it to was no longer there. So it was a new editor and they loved it and they were really fun to work with. Yeah. So, all right. So I think we can fast forward to, to that book, which is here. Yeah. Um, and so that just came out or about a year ago, I think, right? But I don't think we have yeah. any. 
let's see if these images work for us. I'm all I'm all browser based right now. Um, oh yeah, oh so cute. <laughs> so these are these are revisions from the zine. The zine was um, different drawings uh, in different medium. This. Yeah, so there were a lot more. There was, um, I, I think there were five or six originally. And then for the pitch, I created like 40 images. Mm -hmm. And for the book, I think there's almost 100. <laughs> and they were just super fun. I mean, they were so easy to make. Um, they were really fun to make, honestly. Like the whole time I was coming up with new ones with my friends and, and you know, it's just laughing as I was drawing <laughs> them because they're just ridiculous. So it's funny you mentioned when when we had the, the picture of the zine up on the screen, you were like, yeah, this is another thing I think I wrote down. I like doing things that aren't good for my career. <laughs> <laughs> but some but somehow this actually became became a, a significant uh, you know part of your of your whole, you know, oof. You never know. That's the thing. You never know what's going to be good for your career, I guess, is, is the takeaway because, I, I mean, I think this was the highest advance I've ever gotten or I had up to that point. Oh, wow. Uh, which was pretty amazing. I'd done many books by that point. Uh, it just, yeah, I mean, I don't really know how it's doing because, you know, it hasn't, maybe it hasn't been a whole year yet. And you, you don't really find out how a book is doing for a very long time after it comes out. That look on that kidney bean's face is really funny. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to one more. Let's see. Oh, we saw that. I think we only, oh, okay. We only have three there. Let's go look. Let's look at that kidney bean one last time. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> all right. So now we're still scrolling up. Now we're, again, sometimes there's dates on these, sometimes not. So autobiographical reviews of sites, food, and events in San Francisco. Now, I don't, I haven't seen this book, but it looks lovely, and that's a nice description. Is it just reflections on things you're seeing and experiencing in San Francisco? So I was living, uh, so, so basically, the, the story of this, and actually many of my comics were, um, so after many, many years of self-publishing little zines here and there, I never really had a uh, an idea of something longer that I wanted to do, but I always wanted to do something longer. And, but I never, yeah, I, I could never figure out what that was. And I wasn't super um, consistent over the years from, from 2000, from 1997 when I started until I think 2003. Like, I didn't really know, like, I, I, I knew I wanted to do something bigger, longer with comics, but I didn't really know what. And then around 2003, I came up with the idea for Kiss and Tell, a romantic resume, um, which ended up being my first book and mm -hmm. first published go. book by myself. And uh, so I came up with the idea and let's see. So I started working on that. And it took about eight years from inception to until it was published. Uh, in 2009, I think I had enough stuff that I approached an agent and uh, he was a friend of mine's agent and he was a kind of a big shot. And I'm like, hey, do you know of any little shot agents I can mm -hmm. <laughs> reach out to? And he's like, oh, I love this idea. I'll be your agent. And I'm like, okay. And like he has actual presidents that he works with oh. <laughs> and, and Pulitzer Prize winners and stuff. So I didn't see that coming. Um, and so we were pitching, like he and I were pitching around Kiss and Tell. Um, and eventually uh, Harper, Harper Perennial picked it up. And so after, let's see, after it came out, I knew that they were not going to put a lot of marketing into it because I was nobody. And I think Justin Bieber's memoir came out on the same day as mine. Like that, you know, I was not going to get a lot of marketing. So, and I heard a rumor, which I, I have since proven untrue, that mm -hmm. the first three months of a book's life is pretty much the time that you have to make or break it. And I believe they printed either 7,500 or 10,000 copies which is insane because like up till that point, I've been making zines at, you know, 25 here, 25 there. Um, 
there when I started calling estrus kiss and tell I actually it and, and this is around the time that I had my idea of um, writing one story each about my love life about each person that I'd had crushes on or hooked up with uh, the book started taking off because people love like a theme and I think that probably sold more than 500 which was really intense. Um, so that was leading up to the book. So I get the book out and I knew I had a limited amount of time. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to promote the hell out of this thing. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm just going to go all out. And I tried everything. I went on Reddit. I went on 4chan. I went mm -hmm. on Twitter. Like I was just trying everything I could and some things stuck and some things didn't. And what, and at the time, um, I, I think I had three simultaneous weekly or bi-weekly strips out. So I was doing comics all the time. I, um, and one of them was a review comic for a local internet based newspaper or whatever you call them, web paper, <laughs> without the word paper in it. That was a review site. Um, and there were some friends of mine that said, hey, we just want comics. You know, we can't pay you that much, but, you know, you can do whatever you want. So I'm like, oh, I want to write reviews so that I could write off my restaurants <laughs> that I go to. And so that's what that, that's how that book came about, the, the okay. review thing. I just wanted a way to write off, like to get my name out there, to get people interested in Kiss and Tell, and mm -hmm. um, to be able to write off my restaurant dining experiences on my taxes. Um at the same time, I also did uh, Said While Talking, which was a topastic thing, a webcomic, which I don't know if this is up mm -hmm. there, there. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just like little like, peaks into my life. They're autobiographical, but they were just like really small snippets, like and old stories that I'd had or conversations that I had that I didn't fit into a larger narrative, but I thought it would, would make fun comics. For example, there was a guy that I was seeing who was a white guy with dreadlocks who uh, was a vegan um, and we were hooking up and I asked him at one point in the comic, it's portrayed, we're in bed, there's a lava lamp next to us and I said, you know, oh, you don't like going down on me anymore and he's like, well, and I'm like, I'm like, do I smell, you know, what's going on and he's like, well, it just doesn't feel very vegan and so was one of them and uh so that was one thing that was going on and also at the same time I was drawing comics for the rumpus that were really heavy and intense and sad and like they were about like suicide and mental health and <laughs> and like homelessness so I was doing some really heavy things and some really light things at the same time um just putting my crap out there trying to get people interested in kiss and tell and also also trying to kind of not just write about depressing shit all the time because like I would like it was it was too intense you know so like having a lighter thing to write about and a less light thing and then yeah I was, I was just basically diversifying what I was doing um but then and here's and here's how so so after about a year or maybe it was two years after kiss and tell came out I, I can't remember the number, but it was, I found out that it was a, an extremely dismal number had sold. And I'm like, oh, I failed. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't do it. Like, I, so I said they, they printed like, I think 10,000. And at that point, like some really sad number it was like 300 or 800 or whatever, like compared to 10,000 had sold. And I'm like, wow, I just totally fucking failed. But then all the um, comics I was doing for the Rumpus, I decided to self-publish that, and um, and and at, at the time I was negotiating with Two D Cloud to have Turning Japanese turn into a book, um, but they were there. There was all sorts of stuff going on. It was it was kept getting delayed because they were you know trying to sign up with a distributor, and it, this is all kind of boring. But like, but it was taking forever to publish. Um, and I wanted to self-publish Dragon's Breath and other true stories. And they're like, hey, well, why don't we just publish it? And we'll, you know, for the, cause I was asking if I could put their name on it so that I could get better distribution and like, so I could sign up for awards. And they're like, well, we'll just publish it and call it like a, 
what do you call it? Like practice, you know, practice for turning Japanese. And I'm like, oh, great. And that ended up, um, and that was a collection of like the rumpus stories and a few others. And that ended up getting nominated for an Eisner, which really get, got me out of left field. That was like in 2014, like three years after Kiss and Tell had failed miserably. And um, I don't even know that that sold out, but what it did was get me on the radar and then like later on, I was doing some kind of convention and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go order some more kiss and tells. And they're like, oh, it looks like they're due to reprint that. I'm like, what do you mean reprint? There were 10,000 and like 300 sold. But I guess, um, you know, years after I'd done that because I'd gotten on the radar of other things. And also I'd started the, the databases at that time, which also got me on, on the radar, I guess. Um, Anyway, so people knew who I was then. So they went not, I guess, 10,000 of them went and bought Kiss and Tell. And so they had to reprint it. But like that was years after the fact, not months. Um, and that's the story <laughs> of Kiss and Tell and Dragon's Breath. Um, all right. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think we need an intermission at this point. That was amazing. <laughs> like, Yay. Yeah. To, but I, I mean, I'm sorry. I, it's, no, it's, it's yeah. awesome. It's so awesome. But like, look, but there, but like, notice that timeline like we're talking from like 1997 your earliest like inklings of making comics to 2000 and I'm guessing you started the idea of Kiss and Tell 2001 or something like that 2003 okay 2003 so by 2009 you're pitching it so that's six or seven years comes out in 2012 that's a, and then by 2015 talk to you now Yes, and I'm screaming. Sorry, I'm so excited. But and then by 2015, you're finally on people's radar, and it's finally selling. So like, you know, we're already talking about a time span of 20 years, and um, that's a lot. That's a lot of persistence, you know, and a lot of like diversification, as you say. And it's just so it's so great to hear stories about somebody who is just like keeps plugging away at it and keeps plug, plugging away at making things. It's not depressing. I mean, it sounds kind of depressing to me. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is a good time for Jess to chime in with the chat. Are people depressed in the chat? I, I've just been uh, captioning oh. in, in, uh, in the chat. Uh, so paraphrasing, I was like, 20 years of putting stuff out there. I feel oh. like that could be the tag. Right. So Gary says, inspired, no way, make stuff and share it. I'm not depressed at all. And it's very inspiring. I'm not depressed either. And I normally skew depressed. So <laughs> thank you for bringing the light to us. Yeah, it's very energizing because I, I think that that's true. What Tom says is like, just, just, or you kind of phrase it that way, like um, putting your work out there, just keep doing it. And, and I like how that accidentally ends up helping the book sales. You're like, oh, I failed, but then mm -hmm. it's kind oh, of like a Phoenix moment. <laughs> There's all sorts of things that get you on the radar that you don't think you are going to, but they do. And they're not all fun. <laughs> they're not all fun. <laughs> It doesn't, uh, it doesn't let me see more than the dedication. It says, see, preview some pages, but that's all I get. So sorry. Wow, I can't see that they had, the, that. this must be like the. It's a strange, like it, there's a link there. But oh, the, anyway. I would never let that font into my book. My God, the dedication. No, I hand lettered the dedication. This is very upsetting to see what they're doing. Yeah, that's probably yeah, how it's presented digitally or maybe even just in this preview or something. Oh, um, yeah, digital. I can't even copy that. How did they do to my comics? Okay. <laughs> I, more, more great you know, professional stories here. Like, oh no, they ruined my comic. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. So we're just getting started, but there's so much great stuff you've already told us. Um, so here's another, this is 2000 and it looks like 11, another mm. zine. So that was, so when I, the, the week that my book Kiss and Tell came out, part of one of the things that um, is delightful that happened was Sister Spit. I think someone dropped out of Sister Spit who was supposed to go on this tour. And Sister Spit is, was created by Michelle T and some other people. And it's basically a traveling road show of writers and artists, uh, photographers, um, occasionally cartoonists. And, uh, but mostly writers and they all go on tour together with like a, with a set of things that they're doing. Sometimes they improvise. A lot of times they have, you know, have it all planned out and they just go across the country or sometimes internationally and um, tour like rock show. 
um, like, like a band. And I think that's actually what Michelle's inspiration was when she started it in the 90s was, um, hey, I want to tour like a rock band, but I suck at, at music. Hmm. So, uh, so she started this thing and then I think it ran for a while, then it stopped. And so this was like the second iteration. And I, so I, it was like 36 days and every day we were in a different city um and and performing a different and I've never really done a lot of public speaking so it was kind of a crash course in getting used to being up on stage and reading things um so if you look above I mean made a diary comic it was like an illustrated journal um so that was it for the sister spit tour in 2011 and then when I got back that's when I started my tour tour for um for kiss and tell Mm -hmm. and uh let's see and that one below it uh, not so butch was something that I was inspired to do um because of sister spit because I've been traveling with all these they're mostly queer artists and I'm also queer but like kiss and tell is not super queer like there's some queer stuff in there but like most mostly not um because because really I started exploring that part of myself like much later in life uh, after the book ends like there's a little bit of it but not so much um so I really wanted to make something queer and so I made this little dean called not so butch well cool Amazing. and I will any making zines like I just really freaking love making zines in fact after coming to, back from CXC yesterday I'm just like how can I make a zine like what what am I gonna do I want I really want to make a zine and I was trying to convince my my publisher that we should give away a zine with my book um <laughs> when it comes out because we're crowdfunding my book I'm like how can we how can we encourage people to 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 pre-order the book maybe you know I could give them zines and yeah um, they didn't like the idea of all the extra cost and on the extra work but um but yeah I'm, I'm wanting to make more zines even though I don't have to but it's fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I freaking love making zines. Okay, I wrote that down too. They're so instantly gratifying. Like I just love that, you know, books, like turning Japanese, I think took five years after it was done to actually get on shelves. So, mm -hmm. um, but like a zine is done as soon as you print it out and hand it to somebody, like it's just there. Like it's so instant, so wonderful. Um. So maybe would it would um would Dragon's Breath or Turning Japanese be the, the thing to talk about next if we wanted to go to one of your bigger works? So Turning Japanese was done before Dragon's Breath, okay. but it came out after. So let's talk about that then, which is there. So I know what kind of what the story's about. It's super interesting. Can you tell our, our listeners, yeah. our readers, our readers? Our... So it, it's um, it kind of starts where Kiss and Tell ends, but it's not really um, it's not the same kind of story. Um, it's it's kind of in chunks, but it's not like about different people for every chapter. Like there's a there's a there's a story arc and everything. Um, I worked as a Japanese hostess. Um, in the 90s, or right before I started making comics, in fact, or right, right around that same time I started making comics. And uh, I was kind of doing it because I wanted to learn how to speak Japanese, which I'd never been taught as a kid. And so I was working in a, a hostess bar in San Jose. And a Japanese hostess bar is basically like you're a bartender, except you just like you're generally like a pretty girl who sits with guys and pours them drinks and like talks to them so I'm like this is great because I can drink and I can smoke because that's what you could do in bars back then and I can talk to Japanese people like this is how what a wonderful job and it paid really well for then I think it was like nine dollars an hour but you got you know you got tons of tips and stuff um, and that was a lot back in the day and um and, uh, and so, so with, at the end of my, so basically the goal was to learn enough Japanese so that I could go to Japan and then work at a, a hostess bar there and then travel and talk to my grandparents for the first time in my life without a translator who was my mom, who I was pretty sure was translating everything except for anything racy that I said. Like she was, <laughs> 
editing out my personality for them. So I really <laughs> get to know them. And right, you know, I think as I was working in the hostess bar, I was trying to make comics about the hostess bar because I'm like, wow, this is such a weird subculture. This is so interesting. Nobody knows about it. Or people who do know about it think that we're geishas or that it's like sex work, but you know, it's not. Like I just, I, I kind of wanted to, write about it because I was really excited about making comics and I and it was an interesting story um but every, every time I try to write about it like I just wouldn't it wouldn't be enough like it, it's like at the end of the day even a really interesting job is boring because you're just doing your job it's like another restaurant job and this is how I learned that it takes some time away from things to actually be able to see the narrative, you know, what's going on and how it all ties together. And it took a very long time for me to think of an interesting way to tell the story. As I was writing Kiss and Tell, or actually after I was done writing Kiss and Tell, I think while we were pitching, I started really working on Kiss and uh, Turning Japanese um, and just figuring out, you know, what the story was. And when I, and a lot of time had passed by this point. Um, and I realized that the real story was me kind of searching for my, the Japanese part of my identity, which I had never been able, like really embraced as a kid. Um, but I'd always thought like, you know, this was like some kind of secret, I don't know, accepting society. So, so anyway, long story short, like I was working on it um, and Harper Perennial had right of first refusal meet, meet, meeting that they got to look at the whatever I did after Kiss and Tell before anyone else did. And I was so naive. I thought that meant they were going to publish my next book. And, uh, and I think my editor wanted to, um, and she was pretty pissed when they came back and said that, um, they, they refused it, um, which was their right, the first refusal. <laughs> and uh, they, they said it wasn't universal enough. Um, and I've had to sit with that for years and figure out, well, what does that mean? And the way she said it, she just was kind of disgusted. Like, and I, I think they were thinking it wasn't white enough. Um, I think that's, that's what I ultimately came up with was like, oh, like it's not... Cause, cause kiss and tell, I mean, it was about crushes and stuff, which is very universal, but it's not like, it's very specific. Like I did some very specific things in that book that a lot of people don't do like hitchhiking and lots of drugs and crazy sex things. So it's like, yeah. So, so they refused it. Um, and I'm like, and then I, I, it wasn't a falling out, but like my agent and I parted ways around that time because I started to feel like. He wasn't really getting the book and I think he was probably annoyed that I wasn't really interested in the in the people that he wanted to reach out to um which were more mainstream venues and I'm like no this is definitely more of an indie comic like this isn't like he was it was like I don't know like I, I can't like he was thinking of people that I'd never heard of for um or blurbs like they, they but they were like mainstream people I'm like I don't, I don't think this is uh this is working we so we split we split amicably um you know he's still my agent for kiss and tell like once someone's your agent for a book they're always your agent for the book and I was like well I have a lot of contacts in the industry now um you know I've met a lot of people while touring and going to shows so I'm like well maybe I'll just you know find my own publisher like a lot of people do and um, I got to talking with some guy and uh, he's like, oh, send me your pitches. And at the time the pitches were for Turning Japanese and for Dragon's Breath and for the Life on Earth series, which just came out like in 2018, 2019 and 2020. So like I had these three pitches back in 2012. And, uh, and I sent them to him and he got back to me and said, I don't think this is right for us, um, but have you considered self-publishing? And I was just devastated by that. I'm like, no, like, <laughs> like he's basically telling me, like, I don't, I know nothing about you, even though you think you're such hot shit. <laughs> and I was, I was devastated. I'm like, I can't take this rejection. I need an agent. So then I got my current agent who's, my, yeah, he's been my agent ever since. Um, and he hel has helped me with all the books since then. I don't 
where, where was I going with this? So that's how Turning Japanese happened. I ended up finding my own publisher for Turning Japanese, who I did connect with at, um, at a show, but my agent uh, was wonderful and helped me negotiate the contract. And um, like, if, if you're thinking of ever doing a book without an agent, just because you have a publishing, like you, you know the publisher or whatever, I would highly recommend that you think of um, getting an agent anywhere because they are really, really helpful, not just in negotiating contracts and stuff, but also like they're your bill collector. Um, they are your advisor or consultant. Like when things are, you know, happening with your editor and you're not sure, is this cool? Is this not cool? Like, it's really good to have someone in your corner who can tell you, you know, what, like if this is cool or not and who know the business I'm going on on a little bit of a tangent. So, um, no, <laughs> please people, are, people are always <laughs> interested in that. So, okay. So let's go to dragon's breath. So, so, but it's interesting because now we're at two memoirs that you've sort of done dragon's breath is a, a collection of memoir comics. So, yeah. so now you're kind of a memoirist. Is that where your brain always goes these days or, or, or was it at that point? It was like, I've got more stories. I've got more autobiographical stories. I mean, I always have more stories. Yeah. I have so many, every day I have a new story. Like it's uh -huh. never ending. Like I'll never stop having stories. I might ha stop having the inclination to tell the stories, mm. but I have a lot of stories. Um, okay. More stories than I could possibly draw in my lifetime. Um, but also <laughs> I'm very adventurous and I love, I love change. Like I'm one of those weird people who doesn't like, I get bored if, you know, if I don't have enough change in my life. So yeah, I never know what city you're living in. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. Well, let's, let's keep moving and seeing what some of these, uh, some of these things are. Um, stop me at any time. And I mean, of course I should probably stop at the Alison Bechdel interview, which is super interesting. It's or, well, people will be interested or, uh, at this, which is, um, if I remember right, things that are overheard, right? So this is the one that had the vegan guy in it. Oh, right. So this is the web comic that you were making. And yeah. You, and you said it was silly, but it was, you were doing while you were working on Kiss and yeah. Tell, or while you were marketing Kiss and Tell. It was almost, it was while I was doing the, um, the Dragon's Breath stuff. So mm -hmm. it was almost like an emotional release ball, um, is the way I think about it. It was just like, humor when I was writing about very unhumorous things in the other realm. Um, so another 2D cloud book. Um, so tell us about Asian goth punks rule the world. Um, so I think it was 2015 and I was like, you know, there's not a lot of goth like death rock stuff that were like, out in the world and that was my my adolescence and I really thought it would be fun to have like this fictitious like these two teens um a little gay Filipino boy and a little like who knows like a uh, half Japanese girl and like who whose reflections can like whose experiences kind of reflected my own but which without having to do memoir like I and who I could do like almost like a funny strip about, um, but like a little grittier than like a newspaper strip. And it was just something that was fun. Um, and it, and I ended up finding a home for them in Razor Cake Magazine. Um, so that would come out, I think every month and there would be a new episode uh, every month. Um, and it sort of followed them along as they had like adventures and like went to clothing stores and battled microaggressions and got crushes like it was really silly um and just 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 a fun comic and I really I was kind of playing with the form a little bit like I was like okay here's something that I haven't done where you're just like x number of panels and then you have a punchline at the end of each one I mean I'd kind of done it with I thought you hated me um but like this was fictitious and it was um uh, yeah, just supposed to be silly fun. After I had been accepted into Razor Cake, I was busy making all of them, which should have been a fun time. Um, but then a certain somebody got elected president, sort of. <clears throat> and 
suddenly I was making this really silly comic while the world was on fire around me. And I just felt like, what the hell am I doing with my life? But I'd already made this commitment. So I had to make these comics. Uh, yeah, that was, that was pretty rough. Um, and I was just like, you know, I should be doing political things. Like I just wanted to make a difference. And I was really just, just, just so despondent and yet making these comics that I thought, you know, it took a lot of effort. It was a lot of work, but I was uh, pretty miserable. I mean, I would have been miserable anyway, because Trump was in office and I kind of ended up, I had a lot of time to think about this and I kind of appeased myself after a while, realizing that the stuff, like, even though I was definitely keeping track of what was going on in the news and I was doing, I was doing activist comics. Like I was, you know, I was making a, you know, I was doing the things that I could. Um, and I realized like a lot of the things that I was, my centrifuge ended up being a lot of, more I don't want to say vapid but like fun like quote unquote guilty pleasure things um like I don't know great British bake-off type things where like it just kind of even though I don't think that I was watching that until the pandemic but like things that you know weren't serious and those were really helping my mental health during that time so once I kind of told like showed myself that like I felt less pressure and less, less useless, I think, because I'm like, okay, this, this actually is very helpful to have something fun and funny in times of strife. Um, and so I did that for a while and then I put it in a zine and I think I just ran out of time. And so I, that's why I stopped doing them. But I think about going back and making more comics. They're really cute. And um, I put them all available on Instagram. So if you scroll down on my Instagram, you could read them all. Cool, cool, awesome. Yeah, a lot of people had that reaction in 2017, you know, when Trump was in office and sure. um, yeah. Okay, so we covered these books. We looked at these books. Now you mentioned, I thought you hated me. Can you tell us about that? So that uh, retrofit comics, uh, they, I was, uh, Box Brown specifically came up to me and asked me if I would make a, a book for retrofit. He's like, it could be as long as you want it to be. It could be about whatever you want it to be about. And, you know, that's, that's like the cartoonist wet dream. Like, you're like, oh, it doesn't have to be young adult. It doesn't have to be this or that. Um, so I just basically, I took a look at like, what, what do I want to make? And, and I'm like, there need to be more stories about friendship hmm. in the world that aren't about men, like, like girlfriends who aren't like fighting about men. Like, I feel like all the friendships that are in the media, like just like in movies and shows or books, like they're always like fighting about dudes or like they're acrimonious in some way or it's just all super competitive. And that didn't, you know, it's fine, but it doesn't, it didn't reflect my experience. And so I just wanted to focus on a friendship of mine that was kind of complicated. Um, and and tell the story about that and I wanted it to do it like in strips so you like you see a strip of like so there were punchlines but they weren't funny they were but they they were definitely endings so each page pretty much with with some exceptions some of them were a couple of pages each page like shows a glimpse in, of a memory of me and this girl as we were growing up together in our relationship um and a lot of it, like I was just, I was having, like with all of these, I was having so much fun with it. I was like, oh, you know, I think I'll, I'll pay homage to Berkeley Breathe and Charles Schultz and like, and stuff like that. Uh, so I was kind of drawing some of the earlier stuff in, the, in a peanut style. Um, and then it gets more serious and I draw it more in my style. Uh, but it was just, yeah, it was super fun and, like a really fun, just a nice experience. And I, it was nice to be able to put something in the world that I thought was missing from it. And I feel like I do that a lot, um, including with my next book, which is also about a complicated friendship. Which has a similar title, I Thought You Loved Me, 
right? Yeah. I kind of regret naming it that because people are getting confused. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Well, we always do things that are bad for our career, right? So, so bad. Um, so, well, I guess we can skip ahead to that since you brought it up and then we'll go back and ask you about the, uh, the YA thing, right? Which is uh, life on earth. Let me talk about the YA stuff real Let's fast. Go. Sure. Um, so while we, uh, we, me and my first agent were shopping around Kiss and Tell, I think it was Little Brown, although don't quote me on that. And I'm actually doing a book with Little Brown now, um, but that's a different story. Uh, I think it was Little Brown. The, the editor there was interested, but she's like, this is very mature. And we have, you know, we're basically looking for young adult stuff. We really liked the earlier stuff that you did in Kiss and Tell about like the girlhood stuff. Um, would you be interested in making a YA book, a uh, graphic novel? And I'm like, I've never read YA before. Um, what is that like? <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, probably the age of YA, I was, I was reading things that were really inappropriate according to today's librarians or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, conservative Christians. I was... I was reading like Dostoevsky when I was 14. Like I was not interested in young adult and um, really into Kurt Vonnegut when I was like 11, like that, that actually got me really into reading. So she basically sent me a box of YA books, like novels and um, YA graphic novels weren't really, they, they existed, but it wasn't a thing back then in 2009, like it is now. And so I kind of had to envision what that would look like. And basically, like I was reading the books and I'm like, okay, I, I think I have an idea, you know, what a YA graphic novel might look like. Um, and so I came up with a pitch, which was losing the girl. And the pitch was based on something that I was going through at the time, but I wasn't ready to write about autobiographically yet. Uh, it was very painful. And so I thought, well, what if I do this book in basically from several different viewpoints, like have each protagonist viewpoint be a different chapter. And, and so each chapter you're looking through your eyes and each chapter would be drawn in a different style according to what their worldview was. And and I basically, it was just kind of like a, it's almost like a teenage soap opera. There's, there's a little bit of like sci-fi in there where there's a girl who may or may not have been abducted by aliens, but really it's about interpersonal relationships, which is what all my books are about and like finding compassion. And really the reason I did this was because this person who I was having some rough times with um, or... I was feeling very complicated feelings about, like I was trying to figure out how she could have done, like she betrayed me, but like how she could have loved me and betrayed me at the same time. Like, and just to like put myself in her shoes and feel like, you know, what, you know, how could you do that? Like, did she really love me? Did she, you know, what, you know, what was going on there? And so I was, I was trying to work that out with myself. So one of the characters is very closely based on her or originally was, but anyone who knows who writes fiction understands that when you start basing it off of somebody, it turns into something else. And so like all the characters became their own characters over time. So that's how that started. Um, Little Brown or whoever it was eventually did not, they, they passed on the, the pitch. Um, and it took many, many years before someone actually picked up the books and it was a learner. They were, they were starting a new graphic novel imprint called Graphic Universe for Young Adults, whereas their other stuff had been for children. And uh, the editor, he reached out to me because he wanted to find new authors who would pitch them graphic novels uh, through my databases and I don't actually have a mailing list of the databases but I'm like well if you tweet it I'll retweet it from the database things but it turned out he was a fan of Dragon's Breath and other true stories so then I went to my agent I'm like well did, have you pitched Learner yet and he's like no and so so again I found my own uh, I found the new publisher but then my my uh, editor my agent 
kind of negotiated the rest for me, which was very, 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 very helpful. And he has found me, uh, he, found, he did the whole dirty produce. He found workman publishing. So it's not like he hasn't found me publishers, but like a lot of the times I found my own publishers just because I'm so connected to the industry already because of being in it for a billion years. So yeah, so here are all the different styles that we're looking at from the different perspectives. And I mean, I just, I love doing this. I, part of the reason I think it was so hard to find a publisher for this was people, like it was a new concept. No one's ever done this before. Oh, they have done it since then. Like I, I know there's been a couple of people who've done these kind of different perspective comics, but at the time no one had done it. And a lot of publishers, especially the big publishers, they don't want to take a chance on something that's new. So they like the story. Um, a lot of people supposedly like the story, but they are, they come back and say, well, this is great, but can you draw it all from one perspective or all in one art style? And I just, I wouldn't because I'm like, this is the whole point of the book for me is that it would, that it's, it's all about looking through at different people's eyes and discovering, you know, the reader perhaps discovering compassion through that way. And also for myself, discovering compassion in that way. Um, so that's the story of this book. Um, there's there's more to it about like on the publishing end, but like this is that's how it came about. That's amazing. And there are three volumes out now. Yes, I mean, so it's like I don't know, they're three hundred pages each. We couldn't do a nine hundred page book, <laughs> but oh. it's all. That's a lot of pages. It's a lot, and also, um, yeah, losing the girl. The first book was banned in Katy, Texas. So um, that put me on the map again, which is not fun. <laughs> I mean, it's fun to sell books, but it's not fun to be on that particular map. Oh, wow. Um, wow, there's so much here. Thank you. Let's keep, um, it's, it's already been an hour. I'm thinking if we could take some questions in a while. We talked about Dirty Produce. We talked about this. Well, we did oh, talk about the new one. The one that we haven't talked about. This one? That but yes, yeah, so this is the one that I finally made. And, and so the, I told you about the Life on Earth uh, book was based originally on my friend who I was working things out with. Well, this is the actual story. About I my wonder. And it took me that many years. Like, uh, so I think I started writing this in 2014. And that's how many years, like from 20, 2009, when the, this when I first was processing the information to 2014, that's how long it took me to actually be able to write about it autobiographically. Amazing. So people could have this and um, Life on Earth side by side and sort of compare notes a little bit. There, there's not a lot that they have in common, honestly. Interesting. This Interesting. is very different. And this is very different than anything that I've ever done, or I mean, I don't think anyone's done a book like this. Um, so it's, prose, collaged, comics. It's, yeah, it's told in collage. And, I, and this is the first book that I've, I've written, the first memoir, anything that I've written where I didn't know where it was going. And I was doing it specifically for catharsis sake because I was like, okay, I've been hung up on this woman for a long time and I'm ready to be over it and forgive her. And, and I was sort of making the art for myself. Like I wasn't like, I had it in the back of my head that this might be a book that other people might read, but really it was for me. Mm. And I wasn't sure that it would ever be a book. And so I was just having a lot of fun with Procreate and like <laughs> messing with collage. Like I'd finally gotten the hang of Procreate and, and doing things digitally. Um, yeah, it's sort of a hybrid book though, because I, I did a lot of stuff analog and then took photos of them and then added digital aspects to it. But so what uh, I, it's sort of a memoir mystery because I didn't know, oh look, 65%, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Looking to see if there's any other images, but I don't think so. Oh yeah, there are, if you scroll down. Oh great, um, yeah, oh fantastic, look at that. Yeah, it's really weird. And it was, and, and as I said, like I'm not good at doing things that are good for my career because you don't want to be pioneering or doing things that other people haven't done because no one wants to take a chance on you. Um, and again, that was my experience with this book. Um, I'm writing that down. You don't want to be pioneering. I mean, you do, because it's fun and you, 
like to be the first person to do things. Maybe that's my colonial like attitude from being <laughs> Japanese and white. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I'm from a colonialist background, but like I like pioneering and, and you know exploring new terrain and like I especially like it because you're just not sullied by other things. Like you're not walking in someone's footsteps. You're just creating your own. I mean, of course I'm walking in other people's footsteps in a lot of ways, but like as far as exploring certain things, like it feels really fresh and exciting. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to stop. This has been fantastic, Marie. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And if there aren't like 30 people ready with questions, I'm going to be, I'm going to sort of. Oh, whip. I've been collecting them and there might be more in the chat. Well, at this point, I mean, people are definitely welcome to come on mic, but but I'll let yeah. you just maybe handle sort of. Oh my God, my dog just fart. Who farted? That's disgusting. <laughs> oh my God, they're all Oh God, what is happening? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. They saw that slide with the bean in it and they got inspired. <laughs> they were like, oh, well, don't mind if I do. Um, I think we had, during the talk, this, uh, I'm with Tom, this is so awesome and great. Yay, thank you. Yay, so excited. Um, and I guess we have like six questions or so. So maybe we could start with those and then go to Mike or how do you want to do it, Tom? Oh, I don't know. I think we should let the, I like it when other people get a chance to interact with with the artist and okay. somebody like, who's adventurous, self, self-identifies as adventurous like Mari, I think it would be okay if we sort of let them <laughs> just, you know, whoever's ready to say, Blurt it out. What's your question? Um, okay, sounds good. <laughs> I have them uh, in the Word doc if you forgot what you asked, but you know you asked a question. <laughs> I could try to help. I have a question. Hi, thank you. Uh, you, you. You are so inspiring. I mean, really. I mean, your story can apply to anywhere, not just in comics. So my question is, uh, when do you start to do this in full time? That's a good question. Um, it was after Kiss and Tell came out. I was up till that point, I was still doing video game writing. I'd been doing freelance writing since 2001 at that point. So about 10 years. And, and I was making a pretty good living off of it. And in 2009, my boyfriend and I got married. And so 2011, Kiss and Tell came out. And I feel like after my book came out, I started getting all these opportunities, all these very poor paying opportunities to do more comics, um, to do uh, classroom visits like this one, um, to uh, just, just comics related things, I, you know, invited to anthologies. And so I went to my fairly new spouse and said, well, look, like I'm getting all these opportunities would you rather be married to a well-off video game writer or would you rather be married to a um, parasitic cartoonist? And he's like, well, you know, let's see how the comics thing pans out. You know, let's, you know, why don't you just quit the writing thing for now and we'll go for that. I'm like, okay. Cause actually part of the reason that he was interested in me at all is because he liked my comics um because before i he knew i did comics he wasn't that interested so (laughs) so we tried it out um and i i made a decision in my head i'm like okay the next time my clients come to me and said uh and say you know give me another job i'm just gonna refuse it and say like look i'm gonna follow this cartoon rabbit down its hole um Right after that happened, uh, my whole part of the industry tanked. So uh, no, none of those jobs ever came to me, but like I broke up with them first, <laughs> which is important to know. So yeah. You can't fire me, I quit. <laughs> right? Uh, so, so that's how it happened. Um, you know, it would have been by force if I, if I hadn't made that decision, but I broke up with it first. Awesome. Nice. Thanks, Mari. I see uh, Mishka's hands up. Oh, yeah. Um, so I had a couple of questions, I guess, um, related to that. Um, do you ever kind of like, it seems like most of your story has been sort of this upward trajectory. So like, do you ever get kind of sort of, uh, yeah, okay, you're, you're not agreeing, but like, that's what I'm asking. Like, do you ever get sort of fed up with all of the hustle and hard work that's involved in your career? 
and oh my you want to have a boring job again? <laughs> well, no, I don't want to have a boring job. Every so often, like over the years, I've taken like an office job, you know, like a temporary job, just as just to remember like what I didn't like about it. Um, <laughs> I recently took a teaching job just to remember why I don't like teaching. Um, and so now, <laughs> it was just, it was very brief. It was just for a few weeks, but I'm like, oh yeah, this is why I don't want to do this because I don't have time for the other stuff. Um, as I'm sure you know, Tom, <laughs> it's really hard to fit teaching in with, with the other stuff. And I, I got books to make and I'm not very good at managing my time when I'm, you know, thinking about lesson plans all the time. Um, yes, sir. Especially recently, it's been a lot, it's a lot of ups and downs. Um, I'm, I feel like for the last few years, I've just been on the, on the edge of quitting comics and like going back to copywriting or something like mm. there's, um, so the, so that, um, life on earth series, I, I don't know how much I should say, cause it, this might be going public, but like basically, so the, the life on earth series, I feel like that first book came out and did pretty well. And the second book, like, I don't know how it did. And then the third book came out. And before I could even get my author's copies, they pulped it. And, and that happened right, basically right when the pandemic started. And I was, so when the first book came out, I did a little book tour, not a huge book tour. My, my plan was to do the final book tour when the final book came out so I could, you know, promote them all. It's a little book tour. Pretty much nothing for book two, but they were all getting good good reviews, um, not on Goodreads, but like from actual reviewers, it was it was getting good reviews. And then, uh, yeah, the third book comes out, and I'm like, okay, I'm ready to you know put this you know ten years of hard work out into the world. And then the pandemic happened, and I got two talks in and got shut down um, and then I and then we we're staying in place and like people hadn't really figured out the zoom stuff yet so I, ba I basically didn't get to do any promotion for it and from what I've been told and I don't know if they're just being nice to me or if this is the case um, for this particular like young adult like the, the, the section because I know some people did really really well during the pandemic with their books like for middle grade stuff but for for, for whatever reason, supposedly, according to my agent, uh, this, this particular kind of book tends to get discovered in libraries by kids. So, so this isn't something that like these, this age doesn't necessarily go out and buy things on Amazon or go, you know, whatever they, you know, find it um, in places that were no longer open. Um, and also then my book got banned, so they couldn't find it there either. Um, so so I was devastated. I didn't find this out right away. I think it was about a year into the pandemic. Um, when I think it was Silver Sprocket, this local uh, publisher and bookstore, they told me like, oh, none of your books are in print. I'm like, what? Like, huh, what? I thought, you know, I had a lot of books up to this point. I'm like, wait, what do you mean none of them are in print? And, uh, and then I called around and like Kiss and Tell was out of print, apparently. Um, I knew that turning Japanese was out of print because it sold out and there, yeah, there just weren't any more. Um, Dragon's Breath was still around, um, but then the Life on Earth series had been pulped apparently. And I was devastated. Like I just, I, like I was waiting to order them until like for things to open up so I can order them and then, you know, go touring it. And, um, and at the time my agent was negotiating a couple books for me and I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, this is too hard. And because I knew now that my books were out of print that I would not get a good, like, I wouldn't get a good advance. Like I'm not going to get paid what I, you know, a good amount for these books that I'm going forward with. And my agent's like, well, don't worry. You know, after a few more books, like we'll get you back up there. I'm like, I'm almost 50. I don't have that many books in me. Like, like it's getting harder and harder, like physically to draw a book. Like the last book in Life on Earth was so hard that even before all this bullshit happened, I thought like I, I never wanted to look at the comic again. Like I didn't want to make another comic. It was like I my back hurt. I was I had a weird growth that was coming out of my neck that was probably pretty dangerous. But I didn't have time to go to the doctor to check it out because I did not have time because my deadline was so tight. 
and I'm, and I'm like, I don't ever want to do this again. Like, I just, I can't be on a deadline again. This is horrible for my health. And I was just going crazy and I was just miserable. And like, when I was finished with a third book, like I remember looking at it and like, I, I, I liked it at one point and I read it and I just started crying. I'm like, Oh my God, this is the worst. This is a terrible book. I can't, and this is the end. And like, like how, and that was even before all the bad stuff happened. Now I through it. I'm like, it's pretty good. Like, but like I was just in such a dark place. Okay. So, so anyway, so yeah, I was in this really dark place. Oh, um, pandemic, and, um, Anyway, then, so, so I basically told my agent, like, pull out, like, I don't want to sell these other books. Like, you know, you could sell what I've already finished, which was, I thought you would love me. And I, I have another book that's out there as a sci-fi time travel book about Alzheimer's. Um, and then, uh, but then there was another book that we, that we were negotiating um, with Little Brown with um, a middle grade book. And I'm like, look, I don't want to draw this. Like, I don't want to do this book. So, you know, they, they wanted the book and they were in negotiations. I'm like, I'm sorry, Gordon, I can't do this book. Like I'm pulling out. And of course, you know, he'd been working on this for a while. And I felt really bad, um, but I'm like, I just can't do this anymore. I quit comics. And, um, and then Life on Earth, uh, the first book got banned. And then suddenly all my books were back in print. And um and so it all changed. And I'm like, oh, I guess my career's back. I guess I don't get to quit comics. Um, <laughs> but so by this point, I'm like, well, I still don't want to draw this book. Um, it's middle grade book. So I'm like, well, can I have someone else draw it? And they're like, well, we really want you to draw it. I'm like, I really, I'm not, it's either, it's, yeah, either I write it or no. And so they're like, well, who do you want to work with? And so I reached out to the most unlikely superstar, like, illustrator and he said yes and so me and Chong Le Nguyen are doing a book together um that's wow. amazing wow yeah um so thank you Texas for banning my book but also like screw you Texas for making me say it <laughs> <laughs> just kidding <laughs> yeah, it's, it's up and down and I'm like and I, I'm also kind of not working on anything right now I'm thinking Maybe I should just go towards the public art route because that was really fun. I don't know. Awesome. Oh my God. There's just so many great takeaways to this. Mm. And surprises too. I didn't know like, you mean I can't quit comics? I love that. <laughs> I love that Texas saved your career. <laughs> Jess, who, who do we have next, Jess? Um, are there any hands up? Uh, it, uh, from From the previous list, we have Jim. Beth and Donna kind of had a question. I think Yingling Ling asked a question mm -hmm. already. Oh, I can okay. ask a question. It's Jim. Sure. Just wondering about your covers. There's such a wonderful uh, artwork on the covers. And what role do you have in doing that? Or does, does the publisher take over and and work out, do the cover work? I want the publishers to do it, but they always make me do it. <laughs> <laughs> I usually, um, I usually collaborate with their designer and and they say you know I give them the assets to work with and we we talk about it and um yeah I think I had way too much input on kiss and tell I don't think like a lot of people really criticize the cover and I'm just not a graphic designer so like I don't think I'm good at that um I don't think they should have trusted me so much with that cover although it's I mean it's fun <laughs> Thank you. The other question I had was, you said you've self-published a number of uh, books. What leads you to self-publishing versus working through a publisher? And are there any, uh, I, I don't know what the right name is for it, maybe venues like Lulu or anything that you use? Or are you just printing and managing distribution on your own? Because, you know, the print on demand mode would be a nice way not to go out of print. I, um, well, I like it sometimes for things to go out of print. Like I don't necessarily want all my crappy old art out there. <laughs> Unfortunately it is. <laughs> um, I, I do everything with my laser printer at home. And um, I used to do things like consignment and get it into stores, but like, it's just too much work and it's just not worth it for me. Um, what I like to do is sometimes I want to go to a convention, but I don't want a table, but I do want to talk to people and meet people and like have something to give them. So like, sometimes I'll just make a zine and just hand them out to people at, 
at conventions, like when I like their work and like, sometimes they'll talk to me or sometimes they'll like email me later or sometimes they won't. Um, but you know, it's just, it's just a way to connect with people and get things out there. Um, it's fun. And I, I'll sometimes put on social media, like, Hey, if you see me running around, if I still have zines, ask me for, and I'll give it to you. Um, I, I just really like, it, it, that, I feel like the zine stuff, it's, it's very instant, grat instantly gratifying. Um, you get an instant reaction from people as well. I mean, not as much as the internet, but like, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's a lot faster than books. And um, it's just a way to like, just meet people and, and be part of the community. And I don't know, it's just fun. It feels very good. Publishing doesn't feel very good. Um, Reading your Goodreads reviews doesn't feel very good. Um, reading your reviews can sometimes feel very good, but not not always. And there's always, you know, they make when you're writing reviews. I know for because for a while I was writing them, they make you put in like bad stuff sometimes. And like not every book has bad, you know, something that you don't like. So they make you search for it, and it's like, well, that sucks. Mm. It, it's a weird industry. Did someone say don't ever read good reviews? You know, some good reviews are wonderful. Like I, there have been times where I'm like, I, why am I even doing this? And then I'll read a good read review of someone who just was like, who my writing really helped or really connected to. And it just makes me remember why I keep going. Um, I mean, I think. <laughs> I think there should be a job for someone to read them and summarize the good ones. And like maybe also summarize some good points from the bad ones. That's a job someone should have. That's something that I feel like a lot of partners do. Um, and <laughs> my partner absolutely would do that. But I'm reading that. I just have no self control. Like I just have to read that. <laughs> <laughs> Jess, do we want to move on to Beth? Has, it, has her hand up? Uh, yes, hi, thanks. Actually, you've already just begun to talk about the question that Donna and I had, but um, thinking about the current comics landscape, um, how do uh, get created zines out there, especially if we're not going to conventions, we're not able to travel a lot for budget reasons and so forth, but we're interested in getting stuff out, getting on people's radar, like what venues do you see as being good ways to do that now? Instagram. Instagram, okay. Yeah. Um, Instagram, as far as if you want to be found, um, Instagram and Twitter. Um, I mean, there might be other ones, like if you could figure out how to use TikTok, which I cannot. Um, <laughs> I haven't tried that yet, but yeah. There's I a do, TikTok now. Uh, or something. I, I just do really um, amateur videos on TikTok of my animals for the most part. But, um, but yeah, I think... Uh, Instagram's great. Like I find people on there all the time and people find me on there all the time. And I've gotten a lot of work off there. Um, just, are you good to go through my databases? I've got the cartoonists of color, queer cartoonists and disabled cartoonists, uh, dot com, dot com, dot com. Uh, and you know, you can put your own stuff up there if you qualify for any of those things. Um, or you can find other people and connect with them that way. Or you could see, go through their links and see where they put their stuff out there. I mean, there's so many ways to access community online right now. Like there's all sorts of Facebook groups and stuff. Like there's so many ways to connect with other people. If you wanted to do physical zines, um, I, I don't personally do this, but there is our so, so, like print on demand type things um, out there. I don't know which ones are good, but I know there's a lot of them out there um, or there were it seems like there's a lot of them out there or you could just start your own Etsy shop um, but as far as like connecting with people I feel like Instagram you know using hashtags or whatever is like I mean there's a whole way there's a whole algorithm and you and I can talk for like five hours on how to how to get on the algorithm but like I I've started I've done Twitter threads about it you can you can learn all about it if you kind of search through stuff okay terrific thank you <laughs> Jess, who do we have next? Or maybe maybe this could be the last one, or we don't want to keep Mari too much longer. But right, I've got yeah. go ahead. All right, <laughs> fine. All right. Do it. So who's who's up next, Jess? Oh, I, I didn't know if anyone shouted out. So uh, I have too many tabs open. <laughs> I'm like googling everything. 
So Mishka's question, Jim asked, Beth and Donna kind of had the same question. So Donna, hopefully your question was answered, but if it's not, shout out. And then I think we we have everybody that wanted to chime in that I recorded. Oh. Uh, Donna, did you have a question that we didn't answer? They... Oh, you're good. Okay. Anybody it's else? But, oh my God, Kimberly Ann's cat. Oh. Yes, I was thinking the same thing. A celebrity yeah. sighting at Kimberly Ann's house. Uh -huh. I, I did have, have a second. Four cats, so I'm, oh my goodness. Hello. Oh. I did have a second question, if I could be okay. greedy. Sure, do it, be greedy. Um, so uh, I see that your art evolves over time. And I guess I was curious if that's um, something where you're like pushing yourself intentionally within each book or like, are you exploring other media and tools like through courses or just talk about no I just like experimenting um like I feel like and I was I for the longest time I was really I didn't want to do anything online but then I felt I realized that the easiest way to promote without spending a lot of money was to get online so I you know so that I had those web comics um but as far as um yeah, I didn't like doing digital work, but then once I got the iPad with the Apple Pencil, suddenly it was a whole new thing. And I'm like, oh my God, this, this makes me love, I kind of fell in love with drawing again. Um, but I still, like every day, I still draw on paper. I still, I still love, love the analog stuff. Um, but like, I, I just like playing with new things. Um, I love trying new inks. Like I just, I get bored with the same old thing all the time. So, so it's just my, is, is that a sign of ADHD? Like if it is like that, that's what's driving me. Like I just get bored. Like I want to try new things and I feel like as long as there's new things for me to try, I'll keep going as far as like in my personal work, not necessarily publishing, but um, so when you see it happening in my books, that's just what's happening behind the scenes. Like I'm, I, I think I, probably play the most around on my Patreon. Um, like I have, I do daily diary comics. And so, yeah, I, for a while I was futzing around with collage and stuff and I was kind of building up this like collage muscle that I ended up making comics with. Huh. I just like to play, that's all. Adventurous, again, Way to be. back to that word. Um, Jess, if there's nobody else, then then we can. Um, wow, we Mari, this has just been fantastic. I literally took about twenty pages of notes. I write big, <laughs> but but like a lot of notes. So like after this, I'm gonna like sort of synthesize some of it and like. But um, there's just so much interesting stories. You know, we started with you saying like you zigzagged your way through this career and a big zag at the end where you're like, I get my career back. I thought I wanted to quit. You know, that's really I didn't expect that part of it. Um, <laughs> And we didn't make mention of the amazing work you do collecting the databases. Um, do you want to mention that real quick? And I put the links in the in the chat. But will you tell people what those are? I mean, they're kind of self-explanatory. It's yeah. just a list of names and like I mean, people. It's it wasn't at first, but it's all opt-in, and so basically anyone who qualifies um, can submit their profile and um, be part of the database. And it's where I, I just made it as a way to, for community to connect with each other, um, for editors to find people, uh, for people, for readers to find people, for um, for bookstores and academia. It's, I, I just feel like there, there are a lot of people who are underrepresented in the comics industry. Um, the newest one is the Disabled Cartoonist Database, which is probably the sparsest just because it's new. I think 2018 is when I started and there's only a couple hundred people in there. Um, but I started it, the cartoonists of color for my own means. Like I was wanting to know who the people of color and comics were. And then it just kind of, I was like, gosh, someone should really put these names in a database because this should be accessible to everyone. And then I realized I had those names and oh gosh, I just made myself some work. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I, I, it's, it's sort of a tedious labor of love. I kind of consider it my uh, community service, um, but I, you know, it, it's really tedious, but like, I really like helping people, so. Awesome, awesome. Well, this was fantastic. I can't, this is so wonderful. And it's so great seeing these threads, seeing like you, you had so much wisdom about so many things, like, like how, 
you had the situation you were going through, you, you sort of made it into a YA book, but you weren't really ready to face it as an adult until like six or seven years later and so many other things like that, you know? I think whenever people are like, oh, I have to write my memoir really fast. I'm like, I'm always like, slow down. There is no wrong. <laughs> you're actively dying. The longer you wait, the better of a story it's going to be because you're going to have more perspective the longer you wait. But I do say write it all down and start mm -hmm. sketching things as soon as you find the urge. Like you should definitely work on it. I also find one thing that one thing I, I was with a lot of students this last week. Um, for a CXC, like, and I, and I noticed there, there seems to be, especially around young, like, I don't know if they're Gen Z, but like younger cartoonists who feel the need, like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to share this, but like, I, you know, should I share it? And like the answer is always no, don't share it if you're not ready. You could share it later, like it's fine. But like all these people feel this need they, they, they think that they're not rebel, relevant unless they're constantly posting. And I'm like, I mean, you can constantly post if you need that attention. Like I do sometimes, like, I feel like I'm constantly posting to stay in the algorithm, but like, you don't have to keep those posts up there. Like I, I, one thing I'm, I'm not going to say a lot about Instagram, but one thing I do think that's very important if you're going to try to build an audience through Instagram is to treat it like a portfolio and pretty much only keep your best work there and you can post like works works in progress and like sketchier things and things that you're experimenting with but like i find that if they're not getting a lot of likes or whatever or comments like i take them down after a certain amount of time because i want it so that if someone clicks on my profile and it, i mean if i'm trying to build an audience which i'm not presently so my instagram is kind of messy but if i'm trying to build an audience like and someone like is kind enough to click on my profile, I want them to see my best work and want to follow me. If they go to my profile and they just see a bunch of like random crap, then they're going to be like, oh, okay, and move on. Like, why would they follow me then? Maybe I should clean up my Instagram right now. But like, you know, not put like pictures of you and your friends up. Like, I mean, that's great. Put them on your personal, like a different Instagram. Like have an art devoted Instagram that's just your best work. And, you know, and it, and it is fun to experiment, like try putting your crappiest stuff up there. Sometimes people really like your crappy work and then you have to kind of think, oh, what is it about this that's really talking to people? And that can maybe, you know, make you think about your own work in a different light. But, um, but yeah, I, I just really curating one's social media presence. I think, I think not enough people do it. They just feel this need to produce, produce, produce. But like, it, you should really focus on your quality work. Right. What was that? Reach. <laughs> That's great. What a all good right. strategy. Well, let's all it's let's all uh, go tend to our pets. <laughs> do we need um, to do a chromatic goodbye or or what are we doing? I don't Namaste, know. Namaste, an um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I mean, if you have a farting pet, you can show it on stage. <laughs> uh, okay. I'll um, go over to where my cat is. No, I, I, I just think a good this is a good chance to just say thank you. And everyone thank should just you. come off off mute for a second and say thank you. And um Mari, this was great. Thank you. I hope thank you. I hope to uh thank you. thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. thank you. This was so wonderful. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was great. Generous. Thank, thank you, you for coming. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks, Mari. Thanks, Jess. Thanks everybody for being here. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you so much. <laughs>